Now we're ready to introduce one of the probably one of the most important concepts in point set topology, which is the concept of compactness. Okay, so let us first start by recalling the definition of how we defined open subsets of the real line. So um, a set, uh, a set U of the subset of the real line is said to be open if around every point or for every point in the set, we can find a positive epsilon such that this interval with radius epsilon around um, x is contained in the set. Basically, for every point, we can find an open interval around this point, which will be contained in its entirety in the set U. So if we can do this for every point, then the uh, set U is open. And we've talked uh, about the generalization of this to metric spaces. Basically, in, met in, in a metric space, a set is said to be open if for every point we can find a ball of positive radius, uh, say epsilon, such that the entire ball is contained in this set. If this happens for every point, then this set is open, right? In particular, we can see that open intervals are open sets, but we've talked about this in the previous lectures. So now we are ready to define, or almost ready to define, the notion of compactness. So, um, yeah, this is just as I said. Suppose that we have a metric space, right? And uh, so we say that uh, a set U is said to be an open subset of X. If for every point we can find positive epsilon such that the ball that with radius epsilon, that is the collection of all the points, the distance of which from X is smaller than epsilon, the open ball is contained in the set U. If this happens for every point, then the set U is open. Okay, and so now we can define the super important notion of what it means to be an open cover. So basically an open cover is just as our intuition suggests. It's a collection of sets whose union contains the set A. So suppose that we have um, A, which is any subset of the real line. And so we say a collection of sets here. I will explain this notation, but basically this is a collection of sets um, that are open. So each set, set here, U alpha in the collection, is um, is an open set in the real line according to the definition that we just explained. So this collection of sets is said to be an open cover for A if this if the union of all the sets in the collection covers the set A. So now let me explain this notation and indexing here. So basically open covers can be very wild collections and they are not necessarily um, even have to be countable in the sense that we can index all the sets in the collection by numbers from 1 up to infinity, countable infinity, uh, so indexing them like with all natural numbers, because we know that the real numbers are uncountable, so for example, we can think of even the collection, so say that we have an open set, and we can think of a cover, um, the, the following cover, we take around each point in the set, all the uh, possible open intervals with positive radius around each point. So this is just crazy uncountable collection. Basically, we can index this cover for every uh, point, uh, say, um, in the real numbers, we can associate to it an open cover. So open covers can be very wild, and the indexing system doesn't necessarily have to be a countable one. So the index set here can be uncountable. So we can just maybe sometimes index this those open sets by, uh, say, real numbers, right? So this is just arbitrary collection, which may or not uh, may be or, or not be countable, even. So J is just the collection of indices, and J can be pretty any set, like, pretty like any arbitrary set. So this is the notion of open cover. I hope it is understood. Basically, a collection of sets whose union, whose union contains these um, original sets. In this case, we, th we say that this collection is an open cover for the set A if all the sets in the collection are open. Okay, this is super important. This is why I'm overemphasizing this. Okay, and so this um, definition naturally generalizes to metric spaces and even topological spaces. Now, I we haven't defined so far what a topological space is, but basically, the we can say that topological space is the most general context in which we can talk about open sets, okay? So, and that would be enough for now. So, um, yeah, okay, and so for example, suppose that we have as a set this open interval from zero to one, and let us consider this collection of sets. Basically, those are intervals of one over n, 
n1 minus 1 over n and the collection uh, basically n I chose it here to go from 2 to infinity because um, if uh, for example n is is 1 then this is not an interval right here we're going to have 1 and then 0 so it's going to be just like an empty set which is okay to have it here but let's uh, to avoid uh, ambiguities or uh, unnecessary difficulties let's just assume that n goes goes here from 2 up to infinity right so this is the collection and we will show that this is an open cover right this is an open cover for this um, set, for this interval of 0, 1. Basically, the union of all those sets um, contains the, the set A. Basically, for every point in A belongs to one of the sets in the family. And we'll shortly see how this cover looks, right? So we're going to show, so basically, of course, every uh, uh, set UN is, first of all, a subset of A, right? Because this is positive, this is this number, whatever it is, it's strictly bigger than zero, and this is strictly bigger than one. So, of course, every open set UN is a subset of A, but, th but then what we claim is that their union is a cover for the entire set. And so now let us uh, take um, a look into it and see how it looks visually. So let's see how this open cover looks like. So we start with this open interval from zero to one, which we chose for purpose of illustration. This is the interval. Now let's see how a typical set from the cover looks like. So for example, the set U3 would look like this. It's um, this interval. And then U4 would contain the set U3 and would go over that. And then the set U5 would be this open interval. And this sequence of intervals is increasing. And so each interval is contained in the previous interval. So we have this increasing um, nested sequence of intervals and they're essentially getting bigger and bigger until they're supposed to exhaust and fill the entire open interval. So essentially if we have a point here, uh, say this point, essentially uh, there will be an interval in this collection that will contain this specific point. So, let's see, so now we'll draw the set U10 in the collection. This is, again, an open set in the collection. And then U100. And then we already see that U100 contains this, um, this point already. So this, so this point, which was a point in the open interval from 0 to 1, uh, we found an open interval in the cover in the collection that contains it right so every point in the open interval from 0 to 1 belongs to some open interval in the collection and here for the purpose of illustration we will draw the set u1000 which pretty much co co coincides with the set it's as you can see it's pretty close but the essence of this is the following one is that um, Every point that we can take in the open interval from uh, 0 up to 1, there we will be able to find an interval that would contain this point. And as a result, every point in the open interval from 0 to 1 belongs to some point, uh, to some interval in this uh, uh, collection of open sets. And therefore, this proves that this collection of open sets is an open cover. So now we're going to prove this rigorously. Uh, with rigorous proof, we are going to construct this interval. We'll basically show that for every point, uh, we will show how we find this open interval in this collection of open intervals that contains this point, and this will prove that this collection is an open cover. So now let us proceed with the rigorous proof. This is what we're trying to prove, that this collection of sets is actually an open cover for this uh, interval from 0 to 1. So, and as we've mentioned, we need to show that for every point here, we can find um, a set in this collection, which is an open set that contains the point. This is what we're going to do. So suppose that we have any arbitrary point in this set. We will show that we can find an n such that x belongs to n, and un is this interval as we have defined. So this would imply that x belongs to the, un the, to the union, and six, since x was an arbitrary point here, we basically showed that every point here belongs to uh, to here, to this set, 
and therefore this set is properly contained in it, and as a result, this, this is an open cover, right? So basically this is what it says here. Since x is an arbitrary point, we show that every point here belongs to here, so this is an open cover. Okay, so how would we do it? Well, suppose that if x belongs to n, it means that um, it has to satisfy, in order for x to belong to n, let's say this way, for x to belong to n, it has to satisfy two inequalities. First of all, x has to be bigger than 1 over n, and this is equivalent to n being bigger than 1 over x. And the second condition is, of course, that x is smaller than 1 uh, uh, minus 1 over n, which means that n has to be bigger than 1 um, uh, over 1 minus x. Now, note here that we are at no stage, at, at any stage, we are not in a danger of dividing by 0 here, or that we, when we made the division here, that we divided by a negative number, because remember, by assumption, x belongs to this open interval, so x is strictly bigger than 0, and n is, of course, a natural number, so it is strictly bigger than 0, and um, x is strictly smaller than 1. So 1 over x is defined, and 1 over 1 minus x is defined here. So we are no, not in, in a danger of dividing by 0, or um, uncarefully dividing by number that might be negative, and then uh, we would have to reverse the direction of the inequality. So here, um, we're, we're covered, right? So basically, uh, in order for x belongs to n, if and only if, n satisfies those two inequalities, but then we know how to choose it. So um, n needs to be a natural number, so we'll choose 1 over x integer value of that. And when we take the integer value, uh, we might decrease the value of 1 over x, but we cannot decrease it by more than 1. So we'll add a 1 here, and we'll take the integer value of that, and we'll add a 1 here. And then we'll choose B, capital N to be the maximal of those two. And then for every n, yeah, this is what we saw in the increasing sequence. For every n greater than uh, capital N, um, it holds that x belongs to n. It, it is really consistent with what we saw, that this sequence is increasing. This means that this is an open cover for this interval from 0 to 1. But however, what we, I think, also saw in, in, in the visualization, that this is indeed an open cover, but we must have all those infinitely many sets in order to fully cover um, every point in there, right? Because as we've seen, uh, we said that for every point in the interval, in the open interval from 0 to 1, there will be eventually a set in the cover that contains this point, but, you know, the closer it is to 1, the farther we need to go. So we do need infinitely many of those. And so this is a special cover. It is a cover. It's an infinite cover. And we must have all the infinity of sets. No finite subcover, um, that's how we call it, no finite subcollection of this infinite collection can cover the open interval from 0 to 1. So let us prove it. Uh, let us prove this. So this is the important point. No finite subcollection of this collection can cover the open interval from 0 to 1. And indeed, let's see, let's prove this. Uh, let's, let's see that this is indeed the case. So note that this collection is indeed increasing as as we have seen so basically when we have a finite collection of sets suppose we chose some finite subsequence of this collection we chose u and one and we chose up to u with an index nm and this uh we may assume that this collection is strictly increasing because if it's not increasing then we have duplicates here and we can discard one of the sets so without any loss of generality we may, we may assume that this collection of indices is strictly increasing. And basically, if this is finite, we chose any finite subset of this collection, right? This means then we, when we compute this union, basically we get, uh, it is nested, the sets are nested, so we only get the set with the maximal index. And so this is this set. But remember that uh, n with this index and m, it's just some finite natural number, so uh, it is positive, right? And so this is strictly bigger than zero and this is strictly smaller than 1. So this will be strictly included in the open interval, and this is inclusion without equality. I mean, it cannot be equal. So this union for every open, uh, for every finite collection of those open sets, this union uh, will be just the last set in the union, and there will be basically um, a number here, 1 over 2 in m, twice this, right, will be in here in the 
opening interval, but not in this set. So this is a proper inclusion. So any finite sum collection cannot cover this open interval, right? So for the open interval, we see that for this, we can have an open cover, which has no finite sum cover, okay? And this is going to be important for the future. Uh, yeah, so there is no way to uh, find a finite sum cover. However, we can look at another cover. So suppose we have this original cover UN here, and suppose we added two more sets, two more open sets to this collection. Then, um, as you can easily see, right, even those two open intervals are enough to be an open cover uh, for the interval from 0 to 1. So for this particular special cover that we have constructed, it has no finite subcover. But for this collection of sets, even those two sets are already a cover of the open interval from 0 to 1. So for this cover, we can find a finite subcover. So what do we know? What can we say about um, the open interval 0 to 1 and its open covers? So if we have this open interval from 0 to 1 and we have some open cover of it, uh, then it could be the case that we have a finite subcover and maybe it could be the case that we don't have, right? So it's not very informative. And here's the big difference and the big crucial uh, important difference between the open and the closed interval on the real line. What about the closed interval from 0 to 1? Well, well, we'll see shortly that Cantor's lemma actually implies that for this set, its crucial, its most important property is the following one. For every open cover of this set, no matter how you cover it by open sets, you can think of the craziest cover by open sets possible. We will always be able to find a finite subcover. We are always we will always be able to find a finite subcollection of those open sets that uh, will include their union will include will contain this set. And this is the essence of compactness. So this motivates the following definition. So as it turns out, this is it's at this stage it's might sound surprising, but this is the crucial, the most important property, probably one of the most important concepts in this curse. So it turns out that for this, uh, for every open cover, we, we will always be able to find a finite subcover, right? And basically, this is the essence of the following theorem, which is called the heine borel theorem. For every open cover of the interval AB, there exists a finite subcover. And essentially, this is the motivation for the notion of compactness. So let us prove this super important theorem and then move on. Now we're going to prove the heine borel theorem, but first we're going to present the intuition behind this proof and we'll show in a way this visual proof. So heine, the heine borel theorem states that for every open cover of any closed and bounded interval of the real line, we can always find a finite subcover. Now, this is a very, very important property. We've seen previously that for the open interval, if we take an open interval, then we could have an infinite cover of this open interval, which has no finite subcover. But for the closed and bounded interval on the real line, it is always the case that no matter how wild and complicated the open cover that we have to begin with, with as long as it covers this closed interval, we will always, always be able to find a finite subcollection of those open sets that will still be a cover of this interval. Now, this property is called compactness, and compactness is uh, probably the most important concept in point set topology. So, even in this introductory course, we are already seeing very important and very advanced topics in topology and in mathematics in general. So, now again, uh, what would be an open cover? So an open cover would be a collection of open sets whose union contains this interval. So for example, if I want to just imagine, visualize some open cover, then maybe I will take this open interval uh, and this open interval and this open interval. And so essentially uh, the idea is that every point in this original interval will lie in one of those intervals, right? So, uh, and the idea is, of course, this in, uh, this theorem is only interesting or informative when we have an infinite cover, 
right, uh, why? Because if you had a finite cover to begin with, then of course this cover is already what we want. It is a finite cover. So we can take this as a finite sub, sub collection of its own, and this would be a finite sub cover. So this theorem is only interesting when we have complicated infinite covers. And no matter how we cover it, we're still going to have a finite sub cover. Now, again, a feature if, uh, here I'm going to construct actually, or to, to visualize just uh, an open cover, and I'm going to uh, construct actually here, there is no way to draw an infinite uh, cover, right? Or uh, even countably, countably uh, infinite uh, 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 cover, it's, un uh, it's impossible to draw here, but we'll draw some cover here and we'll see some, uh, I mean, just ways to think of open covers. So the idea here is that we have those intervals. And one key feature here is that when we have, we see that those open intervals that we take, they kind of have to overlap. Why? Because if they only touch at the edges, right, then they do not contain this endpoint. And so this endpoint will not be covered by those intervals if they're only touching. So um, either they have to overlap or there will be another like third interval that will contain this point and then since those intervals are open there will be an, an overlap of this third interval with this interval and with this interval right so essentially to have to, to cover it by um, those open intervals or open sets every open sets uh, every open set um, contains an open interval around each of its points um, yeah we, we mentioned that before so now if I want to complete this cover so for example I have this um, this collection of covers this is it, and then, okay, finally, we were ab able to cover every point in this interval by those open sets. So this is an example of an open cover, how we should, thi should think of it, and um, it covers it covers this, this interval. But actually, um, just to remind us that we could have a very complicated cover, so for example, if we add the previous cover that we've seen previ in, in the previous series, so for example, we can take this, open interval and to add to toss it in and then we could have this one and this one and this one we could have many uh, such um, open intervals right it can be a complicated system and then we could discard maybe a few from here and right maybe maybe this is just infinite cover which is complicated and then maybe there is no way to find a finite sub cover for this right so we're going to prove that this is not the case so um, let us for a moment focus on this finite cover of this closed interval and actually just a good way it's kind of cluttered here because it sits here on top so a good way to think about the cover even though it has to coincide and overlap with this original interval it's good to think of it for purposes of you know uh, having this picture that you have in, in, in your own mind as this collection of open sets but that kind of sits on top of it just for the purpose of illustration. So again, if you want the accurate picture, then you need to take every interval from here on the top and project it to the bottom. But right, this is just a good way of visualizing the cover. Although it overlaps and it sits at the same place, it's good to think of it as something that sits, sits on top of it, like in a parallel dimension, similarly in a way that when we cover something, something in the real world. Right, so we have uh, this open cover and now suppose that this cover is really really complicated so let's ignore this open cover for now and we will undraw those sets okay so suppose somewhere here we're not seeing it yet but we have this open cover which is super complicated right and basically we want to prove that this cover whatever arbitrary cover that we have must always have a finite sub cover right and how are we going to apply Cantor's lemma here so suppose that this closed interval that we have here doesn't have uh, we have this and we have here some open cover which doesn't have a finite sub cover. Suppose that this is the case. Suppose that we cannot find find sub cover. Then uh, well, how are we going to invoke invoke Cantor's lemma here? Then we can look at this middle from here up to here and this other half from the middle up to zero. We have those two intervals, and then. Uh, the idea is the following one. At least one of those intervals doesn't have a finite sub cover. Why is that? Because if both of them, for both of them, we could find a finite sub cover, then just taking those, those sub collections, we would obtain a finite sub cover 
for this original interval and then it will contradict our assumption assumption right so at least one of those halves suppose it is this this half that doesn't have a finite subcover right we have some open cover that covers the entire interval but there is no finite subcover for the entire interval so for at least one of the house uh, halves suppose for this half we don't have a finite subcover um, of this cover that sits somewhere here on top uh, we don't see it but there is no finite subcover for this interval right and then again we uh, can uh, continue this process inductively so we can now bisect this interval into two intervals right we have this half uh, the green one and the other half so at least one of those halves by the same argument is the same reasoning is not going to have a finite subcover because if both of them had finite subcovers then uh, we could just take the reunion and this would be a finite subcover for this interval and we assume that it doesn't have, right? And so essentially we can continue the same argument and we're going to have this construction like in the Contras Lemma. So you see Contras Lemma reappearing here just like it, uh, it reappeared in the Boltzmann Weierstrass theorem and so it suggests a connection. So actually uh, this in, in this case in, in the real line we have that the notion that is called sequential compactness which is essentially what is said in the bolzano weierstrass theorem, is equivalent to this compactness that every cover has a finite subcover. But this was just a side remark. So again, we're going to continue this process of Contras lemma, and we're going to have the sequence of nested intervals. And basically at every stage, we, can, we, we choose a sub-interval, right, that doesn't have a finite subcover. So we have a cover here that contains for every point, remember that for every point for this big interval, every, po every point that we choose, there exists somewhere an open set in our original cover that has to contain this point, just by definition of what it means to be a cover, right? And so uh, we have constructed an infinite sequence of nested intervals such that each interval in the sequence doesn't have a finite subcover of the original cover. And so basically now the Contras lemma says that there exists a point which is a point in common for all the intervals. So let this point be here. This is a point C and I draw this line on purpose so that we will be able to see it visually better. So here's the promise of Contras Lemma. We're going to have a unique point that is in common for all the points in the interval, right? And it's going to be in the intersection. But this point, here's, here's the thing, it belongs to this original interval, right? But for this original interval, what do we know for this original interval? For this original interval, we know that somewhere here on top, of course it's uh, on the same place here, but somewhere here on top in our cover, there is an open set that has to contain this point C. Why? Because we have a cover. So there has to be an open set uh, here that contains this point C. So let's um, look at this set. This, this is this open set that we see here. It sits here on top. But basically, it contains this point C, right? But since this open uh, this set is open, it means that it contains a symmetric interval around this. Like if this is the point C, then we can take an interval here C plus epsilon C minus epsilon that sits in here, because this is open and C belongs to it. Then we have this interval, symmetric interval, right? That sits over here. This is C minus epsilon C plus epsilon that contains the point C and is contained in this interval. So now let's do the following thing. Now that we have this uh, figured out, now let's undraw all this clutter that we have down here, all those intervals and see what we have. So now let's undraw those, right? And essentially what we have here is that we have a point C here and uh, here we have an interval around C, which is contained in an open set on the cover. So now let's remember that what we had is just a mental image that the cover sits here on top. And let's bring the cover down to the bottom, right? So in this color, this bigger uh, set is just one of the open sets in the collection, which contains the point C. And therefore it contains an interval um, with some positive radius epsilon, so to say, right? And um, and this symmetric interval contains this point which sits in the bigger one. Now the idea is that this nested sequence of intervals is going to converge to the point C and their um, diameter shrinks to zero, right? So um, 
what we're going to have is that if we plot those intervals now, essentially we're going to get an interval in this nested sequence of intervals for which we assume that there is no finite subcover, we're essentially going to have that the sequence of intervals converges and uh, around this point and there will be an interval in the sequence which will be contained in this symmetric interval and as a result it's going to be contained in this bigger interval which is an element of the cover and hopefully uh, you're now seeing where the contradiction is. So now let's draw the process of what is happening here. So let's zoom out for a moment. And here's our point C, right? This is our point C. And this is uh, this interval. And here we have this tiny uh, open interval, uh, an, element, uh, an element of the cover that contains this point C. So now let us draw the sequence of interval once again. So we have the central I2, and I2 has no finite subcover here, right? And contains this point C. And then this interval contains the point C but has no finite subcover. And then this one contains the point C but has no finite subcover. And then this one has uh, contains the point C and has no finite subcover. And then this one. And you see that they're shrinking. Now, now let's zoom in. And so this interval again contains the point C. It is I mean, smaller, but it has no finite subcover by an element uh, of, of the cover. And then this one doesn't have a finite subcover, and this one doesn't have a finite subcover, and this one doesn't have a finite subcover, and this one doesn't have a finite subcover. So now let's zoom in and see. Oh, let's see what happened. So now this interval in this color that we see here, the smallest one, we assumed for it that it doesn't have a finite subcover. But this interval entirely, entirely is contained in an open interval, which is symmetric around this point C, which is in turn contained in this interval uh, in this bluish color, which is even bigger, which is an element in the original cover. So now we have an open, a single open set, a single open set that we have here which is an element of our open cover that contains this entire interval. And then this is a contradiction. Why? Because it means that this interval can be covered by a single element of the open cover. So this means that this interval has a finite subcover of size 1, right? It would be enough to take one element of the open cover to cover this entire interval. And this is a contradiction because we assumed that for this interval there is no finite subcover. So this is a contradiction. It contradicts the assumption if we go back and unwind what we have seen here. So it contradicts the assumption that the entire closed interval doesn't have a finite subcover. So this is a contradiction and it means that this arbitrary cover that we had, right, it means that it must have uh, we must be able to find a finite subcollection of those open sets that will be able to cover this entire interval. And remember that this construction worked because of Cantor's lemma, and it worked because of uh, uh, because of the intervals were closed, and then there was a unique point in this intersection that has to belong to this interval. So there is the visual idea behind the proof of the heine borel's theorem, because essentially, again. Let us say it. there is going to be a unique point in the intersection of all those intervals, and then uh, there will be an open set that contains this interval, and it means that it would contain a, an open interval of uh, positive radius, say um, epsilon, right? And uh, that uh, this um, this is going to be of pos positive radius, and uh, the results in this nested sequence of intervals tends to length zero and has to contain the interval. basically the end points of those intervals right they converge to the point c so uh suppose that we have an open cover of this interval and suppose that it has no finite subcover okay so what does this mean it means that uh if we were now we will apply the reasoning that we have in Cantor's lemma if we were to subdivide this interval into two halves, right? So basically this means that at least one of those two halves of the interval has no finite subcover. Why? 
because if both of them had finite subcovers, then we could find the a finite subcover for this one and finite a cover for this one and take their union and this would be a finite subcover for the entire interval, right? And then uh, the pattern of Cantor's lemma repeats itself or, or this reasoning, reasoning. So now we choose any of those halves that doesn't have a finite subcover. It's either this one or this one, or if it's uh, both of them don't have, then we choose any one of those arbitrarily, right? And so we choose this interval which doesn't have a finite subcover and um, and we denote it by I1. And then we're back into the same situation. If we look at the two halves of I1, then again, at least one of those halves doesn't have a finite subcover. And then we're going to continue inductively. So we'll denote the one that doesn't have a finite subcover by I2, and in end, its endpoints will be A2, B2, right? And so those intervals uh, don't have a finite subcover, and then, then inductively, uh, we're going to assume by strong by the principle of strong induction. We suppose that we have defined or we have found a nested sequence of intervals, which goes from one up to n, and each of those intervals um, uh, doesn't. There is no way to cover it by finitely many um, open sets from the collection from the original cover. There is no way that we can find a finite sub collection of the original cover that will cover any of those intervals, right? Uh, moreover, those intervals um, are the sections of the previous interval, so the length of each uh, interval is half of the length of its parents, parent interval, right? So, the difference between the endpoints here is the diameter of IK, basically the longest distance between any two points in IK is just half of the longest distance in IK minus 1. Note that this is like repeating, exactly repeating the proof of Cantor's lemma so far, right? So, um, since, uh, all right, and now, uh, again, we have assumed by induction that we've reached this far, and that this ion has no finite subcover, and basically we need to show that we can continue the chain. So now, again, the same principle, ion has no finite subcover, uh, so at least one of its halves doesn't have any finite subcover, and we'll denote by i n plus one the half any of the halves that doesn't have a finite subcover. And so then, uh, basically, the i n plus one can be covered by any finite subcollection of the original collection. This one. And secondly, we have this decreasing uh, nested sequence of intervals. Uh, thirdly, the diameter of each one is half of the uh, diameter of the previous, and this concludes the inductive step. So basically, we are now in the conditions of Cantor's lemma. Why? Because those intervals are shrinking and their length tends to zero, uh, because the length of the nth interval is just the length of the first interval uh, divided by 2 to the power of n, because we've done n dissections here, right? And what it's, it's a constant divided by 2 to the power of n, so as n tends to infinity, this tends to zero, so the length of the intervals tends to zero. Therefore, we are exactly on at the conditions of Cantor's lemma. And therefore, this means that um, we now can apply Cantor's lemma. And it's very important that those interval intervals are closed. This wouldn't have worked for open intervals, but, you know, Cantor's lemma talks about closed intervals, and uh, what we have here is closed intervals. So Cantor's lemma, lemma now guarantees that since the diameter of um, the intervals here tends to zero, that there exists by Cantor's lemma, according to Cantor's lemma, we are in the realm of the real numbers, there exists a unique real number, uh, C, that is in common for all the intervals, that is the intersection of all those intervals. So note that C belongs to this uh, original interval AB, and C belongs to IN for every N. Those are the, this is just one of the things that uh, Cantor's lemma uh, guarantees, because C is in the intersection, the intersection of all those, means that C belongs to every interval. All right. So what does does this mean for us? Well, basically, this this means that uh, since this is an open cover, right, then there exists at least one open set U in the cover that would contain the point C. Why? Because C belongs to the interval AB. Okay, C belongs to the interval AB, and therefore C has to belong to. I mean, 
this is u alpha is an open cover, right? So this means that every point in this closed interval belongs to at least one of the sets, open sets in the cover, in this open cover. So this, this is important. And so what would this mean for us? Well, this means for us that uh, since u is an open set, this is very important. This is the part where we use that the cover is open. This means that there exists a positive epsilon such that this interval with radius epsilon around C is contained in the open set U. All right, so now um, what does this give? How do we proceed? Well, basically now we return to the sequence of intervals. So again, Cantor's lemma uh, says that those intervals that we have defined, a n, the sequence a n of the end points of the interval, remember that C is a point that is in common for all the intervals, and it means that the sequence a n converges to C and the sequence BN converges to C, so the limit of both of the sequences is C. So now if we use the definition of the lemma here, this means that for every positive epsilon, there we can find N1 of epsilon, uh, such that, for example, the distance between... Note that um, AN, according to Kant's lemma, one of the things that is guaranteed, is monotonically increasing towards C, so basically here, according to limit definition, we would have C minus AN, Remember that C is the limit of AN in the absolute value, but since C is strictly bigger than AN, we can just get rid of the absolute value here. And so, um, in the limit definition, the difference between the sequence and its limit can be made as small as we please, just arbitrary small, smaller than any uh, than epsilon half, right? So, for epsilon that is positive, we can make uh, for every N that is greater than N1, uh, that this difference would be smaller than epsilon half. And similarly, for every n that is greater than n2, the difference between bn and its limit is going to be smaller than epsilon half, right? For every n greater than n2. So now, if we were to choose n, which is the maximum of those two, plus one, just to be on the safe side, then what we're going to have that bn is just by, you know, switching this inequality here. So, um, Remember that um, here, if we switch uh, switch this one, so an is going to be bigger if we an goes to this side and epsilon over two goes to this side. So this is equivalent to saying that an is greater than c minus epsilon uh, half. This is this is this part, and the other part. This one means that bn is smaller than c plus epsilon half, right? And this holds basically for this n and for every n that is greater than this n, this n of epsilon, right? So we have this inequality, but what this means, it means for us, uh, sorry, that this interval i n, which is the closed interval containing n and b n, is contained in this open interval uh, from c minus epsilon to c plus epsilon, but remember that u was an open set and so it contained the point C, and as a result, it contained this open interval with radius epsilon around the point C. So this means that the interval I n is actually contained in one of the uh, open sets in the open cover. But this is a contradiction. Why is this a contradiction? Because we assumed that for every stage, um, each of those intervals in the construction doesn't have a finite subcover. No finite subcollection of the original open cover can cover this any of those intervals. But here we have just a finite subcollection. We have just one set from this open collection of open sets that covers this interval. This interval is entirely contained. So we have here a finite subcover, basically a subcover that contains one set. So we have here an open cover with with one set, an open cover with a single set that contains this interval i n, and this is a contradiction because we assume that by construction, each of the intervals in this chain of nested intervals doesn't have an open cover. So what does this contradict? It contradicts our original assumption that the open that the, the close. This is a contradiction. It contradicts the assumption that the original interval has no finite subcover. It contradicts this. It means that it must have a finite subcover if we have arrived at the contradiction. But we didn't assume anything on the original cover, 
we didn't just see anything on the cover that covered this open set. We just took arbitrary open cover. And so this means that this arbitrary open cover must have an open sub cover that covers the closed interval AB. This means essentially what we wanted to prove. This means that every, this is, this is important, yeah, every open cover of the closed interval AB, for every open cover there exists a finite sub cover that covers the closed interval AB. And this is probably the most impro important property of the closed interval AB, and this property is this compactness. So it motivates the following definition, and the definition is the following one. If we have a topological space, now we haven't defined exactly what a topological space is, but let's just say again that topological space is the most general context in which we can talk about open sets, right? So suppose that this is just the most general setup where open sets are defined, okay? And so we say that a subset K of a topological space X is compact if for every open cover of K, no matter how we cover K by open sets, we can all always find a finite subcover.